Amen. Y'all let them know how much you appreciate them leading us this morning. Uh, bless by them. And uh, Jason Chester and his family. Jason's actually going to be our worship leader over at Concord at Habersham. So I'm excited about his service there. Well, we're still in a series right now called The King is Coming. And uh, we're going to be in that series today as well as next Sunday. And then hopefully we'll dive into something brand new following that unless Jesus comes, which I'm all for. Y'all down with that? Say amen. All right. I don't know why I'm doing this right here, but uh, apparently this is the Jesus is coming sign. All right. But anyway. Hey, listen, uh, just real quick, open up your Bibles, Revelation chapter 20 this morning, Revelation chapter 20, and as you're opening up your Bible, our main and key verses today are going to be verses 11 through 15, but I do want to kind of freshen your mind on the concept of the end times, what all is actually going to go down, and that's why we still have our redneck timeline up here behind me, and so very quickly, let me just remind you, everything on the floor right here represents those things that are going to be happening on the earth. Everything up above represents those things are going to be happening in God's home in heaven, all right? So right now, you and I are living, it's what is known as the church age. Now, the church, although I have a building here to represent it, is actually not a building. The church is a group of people. The church began after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and all of those who respond to his message by faith they receive the Holy Spirit. And the moment the Spirit of God takes up residence in their life, they become members of the church, the church universal. Now, the Bible teaches that the church age is actually going to end at this great trumpet which will sound in the sky. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that a rapture is going to occur, a great catching up of all of the saints who are living. And that's going to happen when Jesus comes in the clouds. It's taught to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it's known as the rapture. Now, following that, as soon as you are in the presence of the Lord, the Bible teaches that you'll go to uh, the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat. Now, the Bema seat is the reward seat. So you and I are going to be rewarded based upon our faithfulness to serve the Lord Jesus while we were on the earth. So we're going to be rewarded or we're going to suffer loss because we kind of wasted our lives. Now, the Bible also teaches that we'll be dressed at this moment in preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's why the plate's there. And the marriage supper of the Lamb is this great celebration between Jesus, who's the Lamb, and his bride, who is the church. And so we'll be in this particular celebration giving glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be a phenomenal time, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But here upon the earth, just as a reminder, as soon as the rapture occurs, the tribulation is going to be set in motion upon the earth. Now, the tribulation really is a seven-year time frame. And it's during this particular time frame that the Antichrist will rise to power. Many individuals will be looking for answers after the rapture of the church. And so this great charismatic leader who is the Antichrist will come on the scene. Many will begin to follow him. In fact, many will be extremely impressed with him. The Antichrist is going to sign a peace treaty with Israel during this particular time frame. He's going to give Israel the freedom to rebuild the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And then as soon as that temple is rebuilt, at the three and a half year mark, the Bible says that the Antichrist will sit down on the throne of God in the temple and he will declare himself to be God. And it'll be in this particular moment that the last three and a half years of the tribulation, known as in the Old Testament, the day of Jacob's trouble, there will be severe tribulation upon the earth like the earth has never seen before. Now, interestingly, all of this will be happening on the earth while you and I as followers of Jesus are hanging out with the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But at the end of that supper, the Bible teaches us that Jesus will step up, he will call all of the saints as well to himself, and then I use my sanctified imagination here, he'll get the angels to bring all of our, um, let me just pull it out, our white horses that are going to look much better than this, amen? But the white horses are coming, this comes from the dollar store, it also came with a pink purse which James Forrester kept. But anyway, so... Uh, all right, so we'll all have horses. The Bible says that Jesus, as well as us, will come back to the earth at the end of the tribulation. Now, upon the earth when Jesus comes, the Bible teaches us that there will be this great battle known as Armageddon. All the nations of the world will be centered around Israel with a desire to wipe Israel from the face of the map. So whenever Jesus comes, he will come to save Israel. And the Bible says, by the word of his mouth, he will destroy the nations. And then he will usher in what we call the millennial kingdom. Now, the millennial kingdom is a 1,000-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ here upon the earth. 
And the Bible says that you and I who come back with Jesus to the earth will actually serve Jesus during the millennial reign. We will serve as his authority throughout the globe. So all of that will be going on. What an, and by the way, what you will be doing during the millennial kingdom will be determined based upon what you have done for him while you were here on the earth. So if you're faithful to serve the Lord, you're going to be blessed not only with rewards, but also authority in the kingdom. All of that is around the corner. Now, the question that I want to look at today is what happens after the thousand year millennial reign? So you've got this millennial kingdom that comes down on the earth. What takes place as soon as the thousand years are up? And there are two major events that occur. One of those events we're going to look at today, the other we'll look at next week. But those two major events are the great white throne judgment, that's what we're going to see today. And then next weekend we're going to look at the event known as the new heavens and the new earth. And man, you want to be a part of that, invite some folks. It's very, very encouraging to say the least. But before we can get to that message of encouragement, I've got to give you a very difficult message, a message on the great white throne judgment. Now, the reason that this message is a very difficult one is because this message really talks about how at the great white throne judgment, people will be judged based upon their sin. And many will be cast into hell on that particular day. Now, I know today in our modern culture, it's not a very popular thing to talk about hell, but the reality is many people will look at the Bible and they'll say, you know what, there's no way that God could send people to hell. I mean, he's so loving, he's so kind, he's so gracious. So listen to me closely. Uh, God doesn't necessarily send people to hell. People choose to go to hell because they reject Christ. And so we're going to see today what the Bible actually says about this great white throne judgment, how it is all going to go down. So that in mind, verse 11 in Revelation chapter 20. Are y'all ready for it? Say yes. All right, that was five of you. The rest of you ready for it? Say yes. All right, good deal. Stand with me, if you will, in honor of God's word. If you don't have a Bible, it's up here on the screen for us. But the Bible says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then Dath and Hades, notice verse 14, were thrown into the lake of fire. Now this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into, what's your Bible say? Yeah, the lake of fire. So let's bow together. Father, uh, not an easy subject to talk on this morning, but uh, trusting that the Holy Spirit will speak to hearts, especially those who have not yet responded to you. God called them to salvation today so that they can be a part of the great celebration instead of this great judgment. And God, I'm trusting that as your word is delivered, it will not return void. It will accomplish what you desire for it to accomplish today. So give us an understanding, especially a clearer understanding of the judgment that is to come for those who do not know you. And then for those of us who are your people, God, give us a great passion, really a burden, that we would share the message of Jesus with others in light of the fact judgment is coming. God, even as John the Baptist delivered the word, he said, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Lord, help us to be those kinds of people. Who will? We'll warn lovingly, but with all sincerity. So God, do a work this morning. We'll give you praise for it. And that's in Christ's name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. So you go ahead and be seated this morning. All right, so what's the great white throne judgment? Well, it's the judgment of all unbelievers. Now look at me eyeball to eyeball in our redneck timeline. The judgment seat of Jesus is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ is the judgment of believers. We're judged based upon our service. But the great white throne judgment, which happens after the millennial kingdom, is the judgment of unbelievers. And they are judged based upon their sin. Now, in preparation for this message, I began just by asking a very simple question. What is an unbeliever? Or who is an unbeliever? 
right? When we say unbeliever, what does that mean? So what I want to do just in the intro of this message is give you a very quick list of people who fall into the bucket, so to speak, of those who are unbelievers, all right? So you may want to jot these down in your listening guide as I feel they'll help you in the days ahead. But first of all, I want you to know that an unbeliever is an atheist, an atheist. Now, most of you have heard that term before. An atheist is someone who does not believe that God exists. And so as a result, they are unbelievers. And the Bible teaches us that all unbelievers, that is, all atheists, will actually be in line for the great white throne judgment. So the atheist will be there. But then secondly, jot these down, the agnostic. You know, I met an agnostic uh, just last weekend. An agnostic is a person who believes that there perhaps is a God, but he is unknowable. So there may be a God, but there's no way you can relate to him. There's no way that he can relate to us. He is so different and we are so far. So an agnostic may even sound a little bit on the religious side, but the reality is they have not placed their faith in Jesus. And so they fall into the category of unbelievers. They'll be in the same line as an atheist. Now, the third that I want you to jot down is a religious person. A religious person is an unbeliever. A religious person is someone who is holding to a strict moral code. They are individuals who believe that if their good works outweigh their bad works, somehow God's wrath will be appeased. Well, that's religion. It's the idea of man trying to work themselves to God. And in doing so, they reject the fact that God came to man in Jesus Christ. And so they may be very religious, but they still fall in the category of unbelievers. And they'll be in the same line as both atheist and agnostic at the great white throne judgment. And then there are also those individuals who consider themselves to be very spiritual people, all right? So spiritual persons are unbelievers. Now, what is a spiritual person? I bought an eyeball for just a moment. A spiritual person can be a tree hugger. A spiritual person can be a dream catcher. A spiritual person can be somebody who has lofty ideas about the afterlife. They may sound extremely intelligent and kind of be in tune with the spirit world, but the reality is they've not trusted in Jesus. And so they fall into the category of unbelievers. And those unbelievers are in the line for the great white throne judgment. And then also, I want you to jot this one down. An unbeliever can be somebody who is affiliated with a denomination. They're affiliated with the denomination. Now, this is interesting. I've shared the gospel with people before, and I ask them a similar question. Listen, if you died now and stood before God, do you think he'd let you into heaven? Uh, 99% of the people I ask that question say yes. Only 1% are true, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, so 99% actually say yes. And then I say, what makes you so confident that you'll go to heaven whenever you die? And many of them will say something like this. They'll say, well, I'm a Catholic. So what are they doing? They're grabbing hold of a denomination, thinking that their uh, denominational ties guarantee them entrance into heaven. Some will even look and say, well, I'm a Baptist. Some will say, well, I'm a Methodist or I'm a Pentecostal. And so they'll have these denominations that they're tied to or these movements that they've grabbed hold of and they think that somehow they're tied to that movement is gonna get them into heaven. But the reality is they've not trusted in Jesus. And so as a result, Those individuals, this is an interesting thought, the same line that Hitler will be in as an atheist, there will also be Baptists in the same line for judgment. Baptist people who've been in church all their life, but they never gave their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. They never genuinely came to know the Lord, which leads me really to uh, another statement. This one may blow your mind, so uh, listen closely to what we're talking about, all right? An unbeliever can also be someone who says that Jesus Christ is their Lord. Now, that sounds odd, doesn't it? Somebody who claims Jesus is Lord, surely they're good to go. Well, Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, there'll be many who call me Lord, Lord, who will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what does this mean? This means that there are some unbelievers who still claim Jesus as their Lord, but they never experienced a life change by the Lord Jesus Christ. They've never genuinely trusted that Jesus' death on the cross was to pay for their sin. They should die for sin, but Jesus died in their place. They never really grabbed hold of the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. They never really became followers of the Lord Jesus. They may have used his name. They may have even given his name worth by calling him Lord, but they never surrendered their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so those people will be in the same line as an atheist, an agnostic, 
a spiritual, religious person, or somebody who holds tight to a denomination. All of these people are unbelievers. And the Bible says there is a judgment coming for them. And really that's what Paul, or rather uh, John here in Revelation is talking about. John is elevating as he sees this day in the future what it's going to be like. So really that becomes kind of the key question for this morning. What does our text teach us about the great white throne judgment? And jot these down in your listening guide, but here's the very first statement. First of all, Jesus will be the judge. That's what we learn here in verse 11. Look at your Bible again. The scripture says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. Now you notice here in the, the phrase, him who sat upon it. So the question is, who's the him sitting on the throne? Who is that person? Now here's what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that God has actually appointed his son Jesus to sit on that throne and be the judge. In fact, it says that in Acts, God, or Acts chapter 17, verse 31. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So who are they talking about in the book of Acts? Him who's been raised from the dead. They're talking about Jesus. And here's the interesting thing about that verse. The scripture here is saying that the resurrection of Jesus is actually proof that he will be the judge over all mankind. And so Jesus is the one who's sitting on the great white throne judgment. Interesting, as I read a commentary, uh, as he wrote about this particular judgment, he made this statement. Listen closely. He says, Jesus Christ is currently, that is in our day right now, he's currently seated on the throne in heaven. He will be seated upon the Davidic throne on earth throughout the millennial kingdom. But at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, he will sit upon a great white throne of judgment. So Jesus is the judge seated on the throne. Now what's super interesting in verse 11 is what the Bible says about the heaven and the earth. Did you see it there? Look at it again. It says here that the earth and the heaven will flee from his presence. Now, what is this talking about? Well, typically, whenever we read the word heaven in the New Testament, we think about God's home. But oftentimes, the word heaven is actually speaking about the atmospheric heavens, where you see the sun and the moon and the stars. So the Bible says that when this great white throne comes and Jesus sits upon it, that the heavens will dissipate. They will disappear. They will leave. They will be gone. But it also says the same about the earth. The earth will dissipate. It will disappear. It will be gone. Now, Peter mentions this in 2 Peter 3 and 10. Listen to what he says. He says, the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in which, now listen, the heavens will pass away with a great roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So at the end of the millennial kingdom, when Jesus sits upon the great white throne to now judge all unbelievers... The Bible teaches us that the heavens and the earth will be removed. They will be burnt up, as it were, according to 2 Peter. And that's why we have to have a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to talk about that next week. All right, so what do we know so far? Everybody with me say yes. Everybody on this side, y'all with me? Y'all don't like you with me. Red shirt, you with me? All right, good deal. So I want you to look, jot the second thing down concerning this, all right? Jesus will judge unbelievers for their rebellion. That's what he'll do. He's going to judge unbelievers for their rebellion. So look at verse 12 in your Bible. The scripture says, And I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne, and books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. So what does this text teach you and I? It teaches us that the wicked dead will be raised for judgment. Matter of fact, the Lord Jesus Christ says in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, don't marvel at this. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear my voice and they will come forth. Those who did good to the resurrection of life, those who committed deeds of evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now listen closely. The Bible teaches us that those who are unbelievers, their bodies will be raised up and they will meet their souls. And then they will be in this long distant line awaiting their judgment at the great white throne. The scripture here says that John saw those who were great and those who were small. 
Now, the great describe those who are of great popularity or prominence or prestige, or maybe they're wealthy, right? People on the earth know who they are, all right? So those are the great. The great are going to be in that line. And then he says, the small also will be there. Now, the small are those that people really didn't know much about. It could be individuals who were not very popular. They didn't make a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of influence, right? They kind of live off on their own. Nobody really knows about them. But if they never turn to Jesus Christ, the Bible says they'll be in the same line as those who were great. So in the line leading up to the great white throne, you have the haves and you have the have-nots. And then notice what the Bible says about them, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Now listen closely. Everybody with me say yes. Oftentimes I get the question, what happens to a believer whenever they die, right? So somebody who knows Jesus, what happens whenever they die? The Bible says their body is put in the ground, but to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? So they immediately go to be the Lord. That's where their soul goes. I rarely get the question, what happens to an unbeliever when they die? What happens to somebody who does not know Jesus whenever they die? Here's what happens. Their body goes in the ground. Matter of fact, their body can go on the same ground that believers are planted in. But their bodies go into the ground, and then the Bible says that their souls go to a place known as Hades. Jesus spoke about this place in Luke chapter 16. It's where their souls are in great torment. It's a place where they long to have just a little bit of water, but cannot get any. But that's where their souls are. But at the millennial kingdom's end, you will actually have Jesus calling forth a resurrection of unbelievers' bodies. And they will be given bodies on that day that are fit for eternity. Their bodies will meet their souls, and then they will be in line. Now, some are like, wait a minute. A body fit for eternity? Why is that so important? Why not just use their normal body? So here's the the reason. God is going to pour out his wrath upon them, and they are going to be sentenced to an eternity in hell, a place described, as we've read it, as a lake of fire. So their old bodies would be consumed in that kind of environment. And so God will give them a body fit for eternity which can withstand His eternal wrath. So they will receive brand new bodies fit for eternity. They'll be standing in line, waiting their turn. Now the text here is interesting because the text actually tells you and I, that they will have books opened. All right, so let's kind of uh, go there for a moment in our sanctified imagination. You have an unbeliever who's all of a sudden now finding himself in line, waiting to be judged by Jesus. So he can look around the line up to the front and see Jesus there. He can see Hitler there. He can see a deacon that he once met. Y'all listening? So so he sees, but he realizes it's going to fix to be his turn. So now he walks up, now it's his turn, and the Bible says that the books were open. So what are these books? Well, imagine it, if you will, that as soon as this individual comes to the great white throne, a massive library appears. And the library there has a list of all of the sins that this individual has ever committed. Every sin in thought, every sin in word, Every sin indeed. All of his rebellion is recorded in these books. And so Jesus takes a book. He opens it. He reads back to that person about their rebellion. He pulls the other book. He reads it. How many books would it take to write down every sin of thought, word, and deed about one man's life? How much ink would have to be spilt to describe the nature of man's heart of rebellion? But all of these books are open. And this is the interesting thing to me because I share the gospel with people and I talk about them standing before the Lord one day and they say, when I get there, here's what I'm going to say. <laughs> you're not, you, if you're at that throne of judgment, you won't say nothing, bro. Right? You, you are, because it, nobody's there to speak on your behalf. It's not like you can look and say, oh, that's not my book. No, it's your book. And Jesus pulls it out, and the Bible says he has fiery eyes of judgment. So he looks at the book and he peers into your soul. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, I tell you, every careless word that a person speaks, they will give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Every careless word. Matter of fact, uh, 
Paul tells us in Romans 2.16, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. Check this out. Even your secrets that are rebellious toward the Lord, they've been rec- You think you're the only one that knows, but you're not. Jesus saw that, and it was written down. But by the way, that's why Jesus says, um, you've heard it said before, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, it's adultery already. So what is he saying? He's saying, I not only see the actions that you do, I see the motive of your heart, and I write it down. Every bit of it. Jesus said, if you have anger in your heart, it's considered murder in God's courtroom. So imagine all of these books open, and that person who doesn't know the Lord, who rejected Jesus, is now standing in front of him, and there's nothing he can say. His sin is piled up way over his head. And then the scripture says, but there's this individual book, this one book. It's called the book of life. So imagine, right? The library's done. All the books are put back on the shelf. Perhaps that library dissipates. And then in the moment, he pulls one extra book, the book of life. Now, in the book of life are written all of the names of those who have trusted in Jesus. And so he will be able to, that is Jesus, open it up and show the person Their name's not there. And that's when some will say, but didn't I call you Lord? That's when some will say, but I preached in your name. I was involved in the church. I came every single weekend. Your name's not here. The book will be closed. Then your judgment will be measured out. And it's a strong concept here of what will occur. But let me remind you of what Jesus said on one occasion. He said, in the day of judgment, he's talking about the great white throne judgment. In the day of judgment, here's what he says. Everybody listening, yeah? Here's what he says. He says, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than it will be for those who heard my name and did not respond. Wow. So what does this mean? Does this mean there's different levels of like punishment and hell? Apparently. And so there's coming a day, listen, all of those rejections, all of those, let me put Jesus off. You've heard the message of the gospel and then you say, well, I'm okay, man, I don't need to make that decision. Or I've been baptized, I'm good to go. I'm a Baptist, I'm good to go. All of those times that you rejected Christ and you didn't really give your heart to the Lord, you were laying up for yourself more judgment for the great white throne. More, more, more. I fear more today for the person who lives in our culture. You've got more Bibles at your disposal than you've ever had before. Sodom had no Bible. I fear for those of you who've listened to sermons multiple times over and over and over again, and you've convinced yourself for whatever reason, you're good to go. You don't need to make a decision for Jesus. So you're like, no, I'm all right. I fear for you. I really do. Because you're just piling it up, man. Piling it up, piling it up, piling it up. Which leads me to the last statement. Jot this one down. His judgment will be final. Look at verse 14 and 15. All right, so the Bible says this. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into, what does your Bible say? The lake of fire. So this isn't like, oh my goodness, Levi is a fire, hell, brimstone preacher. No, man, this is me reading my Bible. This is what Jesus taught as well. In other words, don't judge me, man. I'm trying to help you, right? Trying to help people. You know, Jonathan Edwards was a uh, powerful preacher back in the day. Uh, He's with the Lord now. You know, they say that when Jonathan Edwards preached, he had some messages about hell that he preached, that the people sitting there listening to it, they sat back then on those old school wooden pews, right? They said when Jonathan Edwards was preaching, people would be gripping their pews so violently that they would actually leave imprints. Because of the fear that was filling up their own hearts, the guilt, the understanding, oh my goodness, I deserve judgment, that was filling up their lives. They were torn up. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards once preached, just a few lines out of one of his messages, quote, there's the dreadful pit of the glowing flames 
of the wrath of God. There's hell's wide gaping mouth open. You have nothing to stand upon, nor anything to take hold of. There's nothing between you and hell but the air. And it's only the power and the mere pleasure of God that holds you up right now because you are hanging by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about him, ready at any moment to singe it and burn it asunder. Can you imagine that? See, I'm convinced when Jonathan Edwards was preaching, he was actually viewing people on the edge of hell. Perhaps he could see beyond the physical to the spiritual, and underneath even the rose this morning, there is hell. So he would passionately plead for people, just come to Christ, come to Christ. And many did. But then at the same time, like some of you here this morning, many yawned and paid no attention. Jesus uh, spoke about hell three times more than he spoke about heaven. Jesus describing hell to those in Jerusalem, he described it as a place called Gehenna in the Greek New Testament. Gehenna was the trash heap outside of Jerusalem's city. Right, That's where you would take all your household garbage, you'd throw it on this huge heap called Gehenna, and it was there that fires were set so that the trash would be burned. But it was also there where the worms would not die because they always had something to feed on. And so Jesus, when speaking about hell, he said, Here, here's, what I, here's a picture of it. Look just outside the city gates. It's like Gehenna. That's what it's like. Hell also, according to scriptures, described as a bottomless pit, it's a place where the smoke of individuals' torment will ascend up forever and ever. According to references in Scripture, hell will be a place of memory and remorse. Look at the preacher for just a moment. Every single message you ever heard and you didn't respond to Jesus, you're going to remember that message when you're in hell one day. It'll come right back to your mind. You'll hear it again. Those times your grandma tried to share gospel with you and you're like, no, I don't want anything to do with that. That you'll hear those messages. Hell, again, described as a place of eternal thirst. I'm just pulling all of this out of the Bible. Here's what it's described as. A place of misery and unending pain, a place of frustration and anger, a place of complete separation from God and others. There'll be no friends in hell. All right, you'll be all by yourself. It drives me mad when I share the gospel with people and they're like, well, if I'm going to hell, I'll be there with all my friends. No, you won't. Nobody's there. Why do you think God would pour out judgment on you and then give you a place where you can hang out with people? He's not doing that. You know, it's kind of interesting because the day when people face difficulties in life, you know, like this, somebody say, man, I'll tell you what, my whole week's just been horrible. I'm speaking like a man right now. Y'all with me? My whole week's been horrible, right? My wife's mad at me. I don't think she likes me anymore. My job's not going well anymore. I don't know what's going on. Oh, all these people are just looking at me, talking negative about me. I just feel like, man, it's just like hell on earth. Look, look at That's not hell on earth. That's not even one ounce compared to the judgment weight that will be poured out in hell. It's not hell on earth. Nobody has experienced anything like what I'm preaching on this morning. But here's the awesome thing. We still live in the church age today. Can I get a witness on that? That means there's still an open opportunity for people to be saved. And I love what Jesus said in the Gospels. He says, enter through the narrow gate. The gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. But the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are only a few who find it. Do you hear what Jesus said? Many people will not find it, and they will go to hell. Few people will find me and spend eternity in heaven. That's why Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but through me. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this in preparation, and what came to mind was um, a hail storm, H-A-I-L. You know what I'm talking about? That's whenever the uh, water turns into ice and falls from the skies. Let's imagine that I'm you know, with you in your backyard, all right? So we're hanging out. You're a very nice person. Thank you for inviting me over, right? We're enjoying ourselves. And then all of a sudden, a storm comes up, and hell begins to fall from the sky. You know what you don't have to do for me? 
you don't have to look at me and say, Levi, I think we should go inside. You know, you know why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty smart. And I will see the hell and I will run for cover. And you will see the hell and you will run for cover as well. The day that I'm describing is a hell storm coming. Not H-A-I-L, but H-E-L-L. And just as you would use plain sense and logic to get out from underneath the ice, why would you not use plain sense and logic to get out from underneath the hell and wrath of God? Plain sense and logic, you would run for cover. You know what Jesus said? I am the cover. When you come to me by faith, I will embrace you, and I, and I alone, will keep you from the wrath of my Father. But it's coming. So somebody's like, well, I hear what you're saying, but I just think there's a whole bunch of different ways. I think you're crazy, man. Well, you'll be in that line, and you'll remember this message right here. The one I'm preaching. He'd be like, I remember that message. And I thought that guy was crazy. They thought Noah was crazy too. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Noah. 120 years he was building the ark. The Bible says he was preaching while he did it. Y'all better pick up a hammer. You better help put this together. You know what they did? (laughs) He's crazy. Until the rains came, till the hail storm, I guarantee you they started running for the ark. But it's too late then. And I don't want to be too late for you. Hey, by the way, what makes you think you can just reject him again today and uh, he's going to continue to hold back his wrath? What makes you think that? What makes you think, man, I, I'll wait till later on, maybe later on I'll get a little over, I'll make it. Really? Do you really think? Why do you think he's holding it back now? He doesn't have to. Your heart's desperately wicked above all things. You're a sinner. You deserve wrath, just like I do. So what makes you think he's going to... So could it be that you reject him once more, and he's like, I'm not holding it anymore. That's why the Bible says today's the day of salvation. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? Today... Not, not next weekend, not even tomorrow, talking about today, man. So if you're not confident in your salvation, do not harden your hearts as they did in the days of old. It's amazing, man, absolutely amazing. When I preach a message like this, how the men in the room will start looking all over the place. It's amazing to me, absolutely. I know what you're doing. You're like, he ain't talking to me, I ain't paying attention to that. It's like if you, if you act like you're not listening, it's not going to erase the wrath of God from eating you up one day. All right? So you can do your little dance around Jesus all you want to. You're going to dance your way right into hell, bro. That's where you're going without Christ. So I'm encouraging you to make a decision today to follow the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, speak to hearts today as you see fit. Nobody looking around. If you're here today and you say, Levi, man, that's me. I need to give my life to Christ. Let me encourage you to do it right where you are. Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I need forgiveness. And so today I'm turning from my sin and placing my trust in Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die for me. Thank you for the great resurrection. Today I want to become a genuine follower, a real believer. And listen, whenever you make this decision most important decision you'll ever make in your life. It changes everything. The Bible says if there's no change in your life, there's no Christ in your life. Because the reality is, if any man's in Christ, he's a brand new creation. And some of you right now are wrestling with this, and you're like, oh, no, I don't think so. I don't, I'm going to ignore this, not pay attention. Stop acting like that. And just turn to Christ, man. To the shelter our refuge, our strength, our hope. So if you're here today and you say, Levi, man, that's me. I just prayed with you, gave my life to the Lord, just nailed down my salvation. I've been kind of wondering about it, but today I just want to nail it down, be right with the Lord. And listen, first step of obedience for new believers, baptism. We're celebrating that next weekend. We'd love to set you up an opportunity to be baptized as well. And so today, if you've just given your heart to Christ, 
Listen, don't be ashamed of him during this time of invitation. When we stand to our feet, I'll be here in the front, others as well. We'll just invite you to walk, leave the place where you've been seated this hour. Come forward. I'll be here waiting on you. We'll pray for you, help you along in your walk with Christ. God may be calling you to join this church body, partner with him in what he's doing here. If he's calling you to that, you be obedient today. Now, Father, the invitation is yours as always, so I give it to you. Just ask that you would move as you see fit. God, it's um, you know, one thing to preach. I can't save people. And God, it's, it's you that needs to save. So do the work this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. While we sing, you come this morning.